very good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinars on ecosystem service, provided this time provided by Aquaculture. We have prepared a very interesting question for you. I hope you enjoy and you can take part in our uh, discussion. And uh, just a brief introduction about aquaculture. As you all know, aquaculture refers to the rearing and harvesting of animals and plants in all types of water environments. Aquaculture has become one of the fastest growing fruit producing sectors and is an increasingly Develop, but also food security. So already pointing towards the importance also to the social side of aquaculture. And as you all know, um, fish is an important source of proteins. It's also a rich natural source of two long chains of omega-3 fatty acids. But at the same time, what is interesting is that it requires less feed than their land-based animal equivalent source. It takes roughly a, a kilo of feed to produce a kilo of salmon, where the ratio for beef is much higher. It can reach nine to one. So this definitely shows that we need to seriously consider aquaculture, which consists on, on a broad set of users, systems, practices, and of course, species that operate on a continuum. It can be very simple mo uh, models such as our pond in the backyard to very uh, large scale industrialized uh, systems. And to know, uh, to know a little bit more about the role of aquaculture in ecosystem services, we are joined by Margarida Saavedra. Hello, Margarida. Margarida is a researcher at the Portuguese Institute of Sea and Atmosphere. Also, Rachel Brown is with us from the Global Innovation. She's the Global Innovation Manager at Aquafarmer. And João Franco, who is a marine ecologist based at the Marine and Environmental Science Center. All together, they share a passion and expertise for farming aquatic organisms and aquatic plants. Many thanks to all of you for accepting our invitation and to be here to share your work with us. I am Claudia Costa. I will be moderating the session today. I coordinate the Food for Sustainability Academy, where we develop programs for knowledge around circular economy with a dedicated emphasis on aquaponics and multi-trophic systems, and of course, to promote and raise awareness of ecosystem services towards the more um, sustainable intensification of the agri-food sector. Obviously, as you know, I'm not alone. I start by thank all the Food for Sustainability team, and I will highlight Paulo Frias and Luis Martins, who coordinate internal projects on aquaculture, namely Ampli Aqua and Feed for Fish, Luis and Paulo are here to let you know more about these projects. All the information is currently available on our website. I, I will also take this opportunity to thank BGI for their support in terms of the dissemination and the full encouragement towards these sessions. And I will especially acknowledge Gonçalo and Mourinho and Eduardo Monteiro for all their support. But of course, I could not go without acknowledging my extraordinary or the extraordinary work of our byproduct valorization team. And in alphabetic order, Daniela Fonseca, our PhD in sustainable chemistry. Hello, Daniela. Rita Silva, our microbiologist. Hello, Rita. And Silvia Moreira, our food uh, science PhD. Give us a wave, Silvia. Hello. Silvia will also be here to support us with our questions and our um, polls. And of course, they are here throughout the session to assist you with any questions that you might have. And about this session, let me remind you that this session will be recorded. So if you do not wish to appear, I kindly ask you to keep your cameras off. Questions, as always, are very welcome. They will be directed to each speaker at the end of each presentation, and we will use Slido for that. So I thank you in advance for all the contributions that you have 
to our discussion. And talking about Slido, I think that the team has prepared a few questions as a teaser for our topic. So I will invite you, uh, um, we'll invite you all to, to join us at Slido. And you will do this by typing www.slido.com. Then you will have a window with a hashtag box. In the hashtag box, please just insert F4S Academy and hopefully you are in. Let me just give you a couple of seconds. I also need to log in, in with Slido. Let me just organize myself with so many screens. Sylvia, do we have our questions? What have, what has the team prepared for us for Slido? Okay, great. So the first question uh, asks us whether we are aware of how much seafood comes from aquaculture. And this is a foul statistics for 2022. So it's very recent. I think this is also a question that Rachel is quite on the top of. So you know these numbers uh, by heart. And so all these percentages while you vote, all this percentage uh, already points to, to an interesting question that in, under a context of population growth, it's very likely that these percentages will increase. And of course, draw us our attention for, for the need of decoupling growth and identification of aquaculture and on the other hand environmental and eco ecological impacts of aquaculture systems and on last year so according to FAO we were already eating over half of all the, our seafood from an aquaculture source so much higher than the 20 and the 20 uh, to, uh, the 35 percent that we propose here so this is quite a lot uh, quite a big percentage and very likely to increase and the second question is uh, okay now we turn into the negative outcomes of aquaculture and this is uh, a work that uh, that's a topic that relates a lot to the work that margarita has been uh, developing and the question uh, here is what do you think are the potential stressors so what are the the downsides that are generated by aquaculture systems let's see so we have here sedimentation organic particles or dissolved nutrients we we are, are we talking about persistent toxins plastics and other debris or is it more about invasive species and genetic contaminations? I can also invite our speakers to vote and to take part, just to double check your knowledge <laughs> on the topic. And also, again, <clears throat> according to the United Nations Environment Program, one of the, 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 the major downsides of aquaculture's uh, aquaculture systems is definitely the level of the sedimentation, organic particulars and dissolved nutrients that these systems generate. So this is definitely something that we need to address. And again, I can see that we have a very well informed audiences, you know, roughly we are all on the correct answers. Thank you so much. And finally, <clears throat> Our next question, shellfish, can it be used to improve water quality? And this time, I think this is something that uh, Juan Franco is very aware, uh, aware of. So, Juan, if you can throw a little bit more uh, light into, into this, this topic. So, shellfish is obviously very tasty and can be used uh, above all to, to human consumption. But what do you think is actually one of the highest uh, um, 
one of the highest functions that we can also attribute to shellfish. Is it about removing nitrogen to mitigate uh, eutrophication? Is it one of the most efficient instruments to bioremediation? Or is it to prevent water pathogens? I think they do a little bit of all. But the literature has really reinforced their importance, shellfish, shellfish importance, as removal of nitrogen from the water to mitigate eutrophication. So 70% of our participants were absolutely right. I don't know how 70% for 14 uh, participants equates, but definitely nitrogen removal from, from water to, to, to prevent eutrophication is a key role in shellfish. So let's all start eating more shellfish. I actually love shellfish. Sorry about this sharing with you. So thank you so much for taking part uh, in this short quiz. I hope you have enjoyed it. You will see on Slido that we have the tab for the Q&A uh, Q uh, already open. So you can start typing in your questions. If you already have a question, we will then direct them to each of the speakers. But let's now turn our attention to our dear speakers. Let me introduce them before I pass the floor to Margarida Saavedra. Margarida is going with... Uh, Margarida is going to talk about sustainable agriculture and Margarida is a researcher at the Portuguese Institute for the Sea and Atmosphere, very well known in Portugal as IPMA. She has a master's in aquaculture from Stirling University in Scotland and a PhD in fish larvae nutrition. Margarida has more than 20 years experience in fish reproduction and on growing sea meager sole white sea bream cod and sea horses. Margarida specializes in fish nutrition, feed formulation and muscle fiber growth. Currently Margarida's main interest is food applicants and food and fish welfare. This is a very interesting topic, food security in developing countries. Maybe, Margarita, you can just also shed some light on how aquaculture can address this problem. Margarita, it is a true pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much. Then we will meet uh, Rachel Brown. She's going to, to talk about health management, um, mainly by phone is on an innovative technology that she's managing at Greece. And Rachel is the Global Innovation Manager at Armour Group, which is a fish. And Rachel is a vet with experience across all species and has a particular interest in diagnostic Im imaging and use of cl clinical ultrasound. Rachel has worked with Volsia uh, between 2019 and 2021 in partnership with the University of Stirling. So you have also something in common with Margarida uh, during a knowledge transfer partnership funded by Innovate UK. During this time, Rachel managed the research program and safety assessments for the sonic technology to be to be used for enhancing the efficacy of sea lease treatments with hydrogen peroxide. In 2022, Rachel joined Aquapharma Group and continues to oversee the field trials and commercialization of the technology. Rachel is also the action leader for the EIT food funded project Breeze, which Rachel very kindly will present to us. Thank you, Rachel, for being here. And our third speaker, uh, João Franco is going to talk to us about marine forests and the ecosystems that they, they produce and how we can all perceive the benefits of having well-functional forests uh, in the sea. So João Franco is a marine ecologist based at the Marine and Environmental Science Center. His research interests at, aim at understanding both global and local processes that control performance and function of both the flora and the fauna 
and how they, these interact in coastal waters ecosystem, including their performance and biodevelopment, particular in innovative but artificial structures. Most of Joan's current research is focused on the implications of climate change, especially the threats to marine ecosystem, and Joan is very keen on kelp forests and also foresting effective methodologies for their conservation. Joan is involved in several national and international projects with research and conservation goals. Joan, it's also um, a pleasure to have, you, uh, to have you here with us. Thank you so much. I'm now going to pass the floor to Margarida. I hope you enjoy your session and thank you so much for being here. Margarida, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much. Uh, do I have to share the? Okay, let's see. Yes, please. Okay. Maybe the, if you just press the share button. Do you do you see? It should come up. It's yes, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to talk about aquaculture sustainability and the impacts of uh, aquaculture activity and how we can mitigate them and then get a better environment and as well a better fish quality. So we all know that our natural resources are limited and it's very important to find solutions for the present and next generations so they have access to food. Um, Aquaculture has uh, several advantage, advantages um, in relation to other animal um, industries, as uh, it is extremely resource uh, efficient. So the food conversion ratio in uh, fish production is around 1.1. 1, 1 .1. Of course, this uh, is not a fixed value. It depends on the diets, if the diets are made specifically for that species. But usually, if you have an FCR higher than 1.5, that's not uh, a good uh, a good starting point. Uh, if you compare this to beef, pork, and chicken, uh, you see that the food conversion ratio is much higher. So why is aquaculture so important as a guarantee for food security in the future? Um, fish has an unbeatable uh, nutritional quality because it's a good source of high protein quality. That means that it, it's a good source of indispensable amino acids. These are amino acids that are, can only be um, supplied by the diet, so our body is not um, able to synthesize them. Um, fish, also ha fish also has uh, good fatty acid profiles and a good source of omega-3 and uh, as well a uh, source of minerals and vitamins. And one important thing that here in Portugal we usually forget is that uh, aquaculture has enabled the access uh, to of fish to regions with little or even no access at, at all before aquaculture. Um, and this, that is very important uh, in terms of health for this population as uh, aquatic products are uh, extremely beneficial. So, of course, aquaculture interacts with the environment as it uses its natural resources, but it causes some impacts. Uh, from all aquaculture impacts, the most important are the excess of organic matter, the use of drugs, and this is especially uh, important when we are talking about intensive aquaculture, as fish density will make uh, fish more prone to disease, and then drugs and treatments need to be applied, biological interactions, and degradation of habitats. This uh, degradation of habitats, um, it's more obvious in Asia, for example, in shrimp farms that have destroyed large areas of mangroves to uh, build large shrimp farms. So if we look at aquaculture in an ecological perspective, we have the natural resources, uh, environmental goods, so 
water feed when we are talking about extensive aquaculture. So this is what the environment um, gives to aquaculture, to these activities, so it can run. And the aquaculture, of course, uh, produces fish or, or shellfish, or the, the target species that the farmer wants to produce. But there are wastes, and the wastes are coming from the feed, and eat it, feed, and metabolic wastes and drugs. In specifically for intensive and semi-intensive aquaculture. And these are the environmental surfaces that uh, need to flush, basically flush the, the wastes from the aquaculture site. If we look at the mass balance, for example, in a marine cage aquaculture, if we think uh, of 100% of nitrogen, phosphorus and carbon, in a cage system where you have 4,000 of tons uh, production fish, you see that uh, when you look at the harvest fish, for, in, for example, in uh, nitrogen, uh, half of the nitrogen can be um, stored in the fish, basically. But these percentages can vary, and there are very many factors that can influence these. Again, diet, husbandry conditions, everything. Uh, but it can be very low. It can be 5% if everything is wrong, if the diet is not wrong, if the densities are too high, if the fish are not healthy. Uh, all these can affect the, um, the percentage of uh, nitrogen that is incorporated in the fish bodies. If you look at phosphorus, you have 50 percent in the harvest fish and 85 percent waste and carbon 12 to 20 percent in the harvest fish and the waste again 80 to 85 percent so if we look at the waste these nutrients actually are being flushed into the environment in very high quantities because if we imagine 4,000 tons fish and if we imagine how much food we need to give to feed these fish. We are talking about a very large quantity of nutrients. And I can give you one example. For example, uh, one ton of salmon produces around 50 kilograms of nitrogen. And uh, using these 50 kilograms of nitrogen, we can produce 10 tons of seaweed and five or five tons of mussels. So actually, actually we can use these wastes to produce other fish species, and that is what I'm going to talk uh, about. But again, um, but thinking again on the impacts of the aquaculture, if we, if we look into a cage system, we see that on the bottom of the cages there is an azoic zone, a zone where there is no macrobentus, when there is a high accumulation of organic matter, and uh, layers in the sediment where there is no oxygen. So very li little biodiversity. And then we have an opportunistic zone where the organic matter is higher than normal. And that leads to the appearance of species that in a natural condition would not have uh, access to that area because they would lose uh, against other species. And this, of course, in uh, relation to the prevalent current. So as far as the uh, it goes, uh, the impact is lower. So resuming this, we see that uh, inorganic nutrients from far farmed animal metabolisms and non-consumed feed have an impact on bo both water column and sediments. And they release soluble nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus. And that can lead to eutrophication, which is an image that you have here. Uh, although, uh, to have an image like this, uh, it's not often, because uh, it rarely happens in seawater, and it's more common when there is no water uh, flow, uh, and it's more common in freshwater as well. Uh, and this is uh, an algae bloom, and uh, it affects organism survival in that environment. Uh, the solid residuals, mainly composed by carbon and nitrogen, are stored at the bottom. And as I explained in the previous slide, 
um, they create an oxid layers in the sediment, which have an impact on the biodiversity of the bentonic community. Of course, in extreme case, there can be the release of toxic um, substances, uh, but uh, it's in very severe cases. So how can we reduce uh, these impacts and protect the environment? Um, nowadays, there are strict regulations and uh, especially in developed countries, and probably that's why uh, the aquaculture industry is growing more in developing countries uh, than in developed countries because there are many constraints. But if we think about them, they make sense because we also have to protect the wild stocks in our environment. Um, and one of the, the first things when um, thinking on having an aquaculture is uh, the location. Um, if the existence of currents, for example, which can um, guarantee the environment services that I spoke before, it's very important because it will decrease the accumulation of uh, organic matter. Also, the formulation of diets uh, with uh, profiles close to the fish requirement will increase the FCR, the food conversion ratios, and will minimize waste as more feed will be uh, used, will be retained. Uh, also, distribution and quantity of feed is also very important uh, because there are some fish species, such as meager, for example, that do not eat when the temperature is very low. And if you give the same quantity in the summer and the winter, you will cause a lot of um, accumulation of uh, feed at the bottom. So it's very important to pay attention to the to these. Um, to these um, specific uh, points when uh, when setting an, an aquaculture. It's also very important to think about fish welfare. Um, I think now in Portugal we don't really pay that much attention, uh, but in countries such as, as Canada there is a, a huge effort to increase the strategies to increase uh, fish welfare because that will have an impact on the drugs used. And if, if fish is well in good husbandry conditions, being fed uh, a diet that is close to its requirements, then these fish will have less tendency to be sick. And so there are lower losses, lower flushed uh, drugs to the environment and also for um, for the buyer's point of view it's also something that is very important because people don't really want to buy fish that has suffered lots of treatments and environmental sustainability is also a concern to consumers but i will focus more now on integrating uh, other trophic le uh, levels so this excessive organic matter can be used by other species And so integrated multi-trophic aquaculture works like this scheme. So you have CO2 and ammonia released uh, by the fish to the environment. And with this, uh, you can produce macro and microalgae. And um, the microalgae can also be used if uh, you have long lines, muscles, uh, can be used by the muscles. Uh, and the macroalgae can be used by the herbivorous species. The solid waste can also be used for sea cucumber and uh, shrimps, and this will avoid the accumulation of organic matter, uh, will avoid the depletion of the macroalgae and all the problems that I talked about before. And here you have a scheme, what, is, what it's an INT um, system. So basically you have a target species, that is the one that it's on the cage, uh, and then uh, the, an eaten uh, food and uh, the solid waste, they will go to the bottom, 
And then sea cucumber and shrimps, for example, can use this organic matter for their own growth. Also, the particles, the organic matter that is in suspension can be used for species uh, from macroalgae or bivalves for their own growth. And this will increase water quality and will give an extra gain to the farmer because this economical part is also something very important to make sure that there is in, an interest, uh, an interest uh, from the farmer to uh, adopt these uh, new models. So this is a win-win situation. So adopting measures to reduce aquaculture impacts in the environment can increase fish quality by ensuring feed formulation is optimized. So there are better food conversion ratios and therefore lower feed wastes. They can increase water quality as there is less suspension of uh, nutrients. Um, and they also can increase financial gain by optimizing production and harvest other commercially important species. Uh, if you want to uh, know more about uh, EMTA, I recommend these two uh, uh, papers that can give you more information about this if you know if you want. And that is all. I don't know if I was too fast. Fantastic, Margarida. Uh, don't worry if you were too fast. We have the opportunity now to clarify any question that wasn't clear for for our participants. So thank you so much for this very interesting presentation, Margarida. Uh, I think you have touched plenty of interesting topics that aquaculture should definitely start to, 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 to be attentive, fish welfare and the, the drugs that are used, the food conversion rates, the, concern, the concerns from from consumers. But I would like to, to pick on, on, on a point that it was very clear throughout your presentation, but for me it's very intriguing. So you actually point clearly to the advantage of um, integrated multitrophic systems because they can address some of the environmental pressures. You mentioned, for example, excess of organic matter, habitat degradation, biotic depletion, and you also included in your presentation, you know, some of the economics that that, you know, producing salmon uh, produces also ni nitrogen that can be used um, to, to, to seaweeds and, and, and algae and, and as such, you know, have other sources for, for fish feed that don't need to be artificially input into the system. So apparently we also have here an economic rationale for these multi-trophic systems. So Margarida, my question is, why aren't we seeing more multitrophic systems currently? So what is, what is preventing, you know, the, the, the spread of these types of systems? Are they too complex? Are they too knowledge intensive? Uh, what do you think is the issue um, around multitrophic systems? I think it is still quite new uh, here in Europe. I think in China, it's there is uh, there are uh, much, much more um, examples of this application, but I think it, it, it is still not uh, uh, very well explained to farmers that they can do that, that they can help, they can protect the environment at the same time, uh, and they can have financial uh, gains. But I can give you one example, for example, one of the rules that I have here at HIPMA is to advise when people want to get a title for um, uh, aquaculture activity. So someone that, uh, a farmer that wants to set uh, an aquaculture needs to have an advice from uh, IPMA. And what I usually do now uh, in my advice is to propose when people have monoculture to propose these kind of things. You can add mussels, for example, or any or some other bivalves to your culture, and then you will increase water quality and reduce the environmental impacts. But I think you have to do this slowly. Uh, and in these kind of things, they will read, they will understand, they'll, they'll definitely need to, to uh, be more, um, how do I say, workshops about these. Um, and uh, I think that is the path 
uh, I think people just don't know. I think it's difficult as well for all the regulation that exists in Europe to do this kind of, uh, to do more developed things, more spe specialized uh, aquaculture. But I think in this case, it's not something that's difficult to do. So uh, if you have a cage, it's easier to ask in the same region to have uh, below a small extensive uh, production of bivalves. But it okay. has not been explained. So the information passes from farmer to farmer. And if no one uh, explains them that they have that option, it's very difficult. So I think mainly you don't see more because it's uh, it's a little bit unknown still. Okay, so you clearly pointed to two to main issues. So it's a question of knowledge, it's a question of dissemination on the main advantage of these systems. Uh, but at the same time, some regulatory issues that might also be uh, around that needs to be fully understood and, and eventually know how they should be overcome. Thank you so much. Um, Margarida, our participants <coughs> are interested in knowing um, from your experience how we can increase fish welfare. Um, well, uh, we actually are trying to do some... Um, some projects to get financed uh, and there are several ways to, uh, of doing it. The diet is very important as I explained before because uh, if you have a diet with uh, that fulfilled the uh, fish requirements uh, you go on the right path. Also there are some uh, for example having these uh, research, uh, these rough system recirculatory uh, systems closed systems where for, for example you have fish and uh, some plants re re being reared at the same time uh, fish can actually take um, the um, the components released by the plants that are beneficial for uh, for the fish uh, health for example substances that can reduce fish stress, for example, uh, and so the fish get uh, uh, get calmer and less prone to to disease. Uh, also, these can be introduced in the diet. Some ex plant extracts, for example, uh, uh, like valeriana, as we sometimes take. Uh, they have Indeed. shown as well good results. For example, when you're sampling fish. Um, so there are many, actually many options. Uh, the use of cleaner fish in the cages, uh, species that have the job of uh, remove, removing uh, sea, li uh, sea lice, for example, um, as Rachel is going to talk. In Canada, for example, and in Scotland, they are doing that. Uh, Scotland, actually, I think it's Norway, they are using these f uh, cleaner fish to um, being introduced in the cages, so they remove these uh, sea lice, and so they don't need to use uh, drugs to um, to control the the infestation. Okay, so you clearly also pointed to some direct and some indi indirect effects. So if fish is calmer and less stressful, um, definitely they there will be more resistance to uh, to diseases. But at the same time, we need to. Uh, make sure that their immune system is, is stronger, is reinforced through the feed and also through some, some other practices, some other innovative uh, practices. Um, Rachel, just, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Margarida, just uh, 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 one more question uh, about the multitrophic systems. Uh, and our participant, one of our participants is, is saying that they are more costly. So you mentioned knowledge, you mentioned regulation, but also there's there's a question of investments. Um, do you think that uh, the investor might have the will, but not the financial support? Do you think that we need some incentives from the government and some special programs to make sure that at least the early adopters of this system start start to, to show the advantage so that others can then follow and copy. So what is your opinion on this? Uh, I think in Portugal, uh, most of the common aquaculture is extensive and semi-intensive uh, aquaculture. I think we don't have such a high uh, um, levels of uh, intensive aquaculture. I think in the 
in the extensive systems that, as we have, where you have a lower density of fish uh, and in ponds, for example, you can introduce uh, um, uh, bivalve seeds. And I think that doesn't represent a very high cost because the cost, uh, the financial investment that you make, you will take uh, up two years after when you have the bivalves uh, bigger and ready to uh, sell. So if, if we are talking about more intensive systems, of course, the investment is high. But as I said before, if, for example, you produce one ton of salmon and you can produce five tons of mussels with the wastes from the salmon, that's a huge uh, uh, gain, Not financial saving. gain. Mm -hmm. So, of course, it comes two years after, but it's exactly the same as uh, the, the start of aquaculture, maybe it's possible to start the fish farming uh, first and then introduce on the first, second year the bivalves and, uh, and then basically have an equilibrium between the gains and the costs. Yes, and actually a two-year payback period is not too bad for an investment. You know? Yes, We wish exactly. most investors would have that payback period. So uh, that's definitely actually probably uh, awareness and, and knowledge about the, 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 the value and the benefits of these systems. We have a very interesting question also about the role of certification. I'm going to leave this question um, to the end. So I will just ask Silvia not to, to, to remove the, the question from uh, from our slide though I'll come back on that I had more questions for you let's see if we have time at the end uh, Margarida because um, we will now need to, to, to move on we have R Rachel already ready online um, Margarida I will just ask you to, to mute yeah thank you because we had some background noise from you okay Rachel uh, thank you so much for being here are you ready can I hand now the, the, the floor to you yes uh, that should be fine. Just give me two seconds and I will get my running. Bear with me. Can everybody see my screen? I'm just going to try and make it so I can see everybody. Yes, it's on, Rachel. Thank you. Perfect. OK, well, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for coming. I appreciate that this is a, a webinar based really in Portugal. So salmon farming probably isn't something that features uh, in terms of aquaculture in Portugal. But um, uh, I've got the opportunity today to help everybody understand a little bit about um, this project funded. It's called Breeze. It's funded by EIT Food, um, the European Institute for Technology. Um, and co-funded by the European Union. It's a Horizon Europe 2020 um, framework project uh, and it's a, a consortium of three partners. So we have Pulsia, who are based in Scotland. Uh, they are a very small, uh, basically startup research and innovation company um, made up of uh, now two people. It was three people when I worked with them as well. Um, but basically that is a, a an ex Ministry of Defence marine engineer who used to blow up submarines for a living, uh, which is very exciting. Um, and also uh, a gentleman called Ian Armstrong, who has uh, around 40 years experience of salmon farming specifically. Um, so he is extremely experienced in uh, in this uh, sector. We then have Aquapharma, who I now work for as Global Innovation Manager. Um, we are providers of uh, fish health solutions uh, within aquaculture, not really specifically fish anymore. We now work um, in the shrimp industry as well, uh, but really focused very specifically on improving animal welfare uh, in, in any way that we can. Um, we're principally focused at the moment around parasite treatments, um, but we're starting to look further into things like water quality management, microbiome management and, and those sort of uh, topics. Our third partner is the Norwegian University of Science and Technology or NTNU, uh, and they are responsible for uh, the environmental aspect of our project. Um, and I will give a little bit more detail on those in a moment. Uh, but that hopefully just gives you a little bit of background. Um, the, the, the 
sort of main purpose of this project uh, is around improving salmon welfare. Um, but what we're trying to do is um, basically make an existing method for treating sea lice better. Uh, so Pulsia have invented a very clever new technology based around using sound in water. Um, Aquapharma provide hydrogen peroxide to the industry for treating sea lice. Uh, hydrogen peroxide has a bit of a bad name um, worldwide as a, a nasty chemical. However, in terms of fish farming and a, a potential solution for removing these parasites, it's actually very environmentally friendly. And one of the parts of this project is, is to prove that. It breaks down, um, as most people will know, into oxygen and water. So um, a nicer way to think of it in a way is oxygenated water, um, which is kind of how we're trying to reposition it somewhat. Um, but let me just make sure this clicker is going to work into the next slide. Here we go. Um, so basically, Breeze has the overarching objective um, to create a sustainable and effective sea lice treatment. So one of the biggest issues in the industry is the difficulty around managing these sea lice. They are one of the most costly and most um, animal welfare uh, sort of negative factors um, that exists in salmon farming today. Um, it costs the industry billions and billions of dollars, knock pounds, however, however you want to look at it. Um, there are very, very uh, easy to access statistics on, on those factors. And they are a huge problem for the fish, which is obviously um, our kind of main concern as we are mostly interested in, in fish welfare and improving fish welfare. But at the same time, we want to improve the sustainability overall for the industry um, of managing parasites and, and improving fish welfare. Um, so the a, a big focus for this product uh, for this project, sorry, is is to improve the outcome for the environment, um, but also always considering food safety and farm economics because there's no point in us doing what we're doing unless the farms can uh, afford it. So um, this is just a, a little schematic. Uh, picture to try and help you understand exactly what we are doing. Um, I am not sure how uh, knowledgeable on salmon farming most of the audience will be, so I will keep it fairly um, straightforward. But basically, like I said, it's a two phase or two sector project. And we have the first side, which is really focusing on the technology and the innovation and trying to bring that to commercialization. Um, and then the second part is really how we can improve the understanding of how hydrogen peroxide as a, a product is broken down and dispersed in the environment after it's released from a treatment. So this picture shows a, a salmon cage, which is similar to obviously other uh, aquaculture um, species. And what is going on here is the you can sort of see the bubbles coming in from the, the hydrogen peroxide treatment that would be um, sort of applied to the cage within a tarpaulin. So we put a big plastic sheet around the cage itself. Um, the fish are very slightly crowded um, in terms of animal welfare. It's much better if we don't use uh, applications that require crowding uh, or that require lots of handling or pumping or, or anything like that, because ultimately it, it ends up in uh, a lot of fish injury and a lot of fish mortality. So we want to try and make sure that we have options available within the cage wherever possible. So hydrogen peroxide goes in, uh, the general treatment um, as per, it's, hydrogen peroxide is a veterinary medicine, it's a licensed veterinary medicine used for sea lice. Uh, the, the product's called Paramove, or our product is called Paramove. Um, and it, we, we leave it in there for 20 minutes. And in that 20 minutes, lots of oxygen bubbles are formed. Um, these sort of will help to dislodge the sea lice uh, and, and are sort of participating in the removal of those parasites from the fish. And at the end of the 20 minutes, we, we would hope that most sea lice were gone. Now, what has happened because sea lice are not very nice parasites is that they very quickly develop resistance to these treatments. So now the doses that are required are getting higher and higher. That's more basically chemicals that we put into the sea. Um, and the more concentrated or the more uh, PPM we put into the sea, obviously, the more risk there is that something bad is going to happen um, in terms of the environment. So what Pulsia have done is invented this giant underwater speaker, uh, which gets lowered into the cage. Um, you can sort of see a, a little picture of it there. Uh, it's almost to scale, actually. It's, it's quite large. 
Um, and basically what this does, it, it emits a sound of specific frequencies and specific field strengths that interacts with those oxygen bubbles that are created by the hydrogen peroxide breakdown. And those bubbles will oscillate um, and they will interact with the sea lice in such a way uh, that actually causes them to die rather than just be removed. Um, and I've, I've got some very fun pictures of that a little bit later on in uh, the presentation. But that is the main focus and, and bringing that to a commercial scale um, is the first part of the project. And then the second part, like I say, is, is really repositioning how the the industry sees um, hydrogen peroxide. So we have a number of field trials going on, uh, collecting very extensive data following um, release of the tarpaulin after a treatment, measuring exactly where the hydrogen peroxide will go, the concentrations as it moves, um, how deep it will sink, for example, um, to get a very, very clear and accurate picture of what is happening in the environment. Um, at the moment, there's a lot of incorrect data out there. Um, there's a lot of models that have been run with um, poorly obtained or uh, just numbers plucked out of thin air, really. Um, we have a, a lot of um, chemists uh, involved in, in, in this work. So we as Aquapharma are half owned by a company, a huge company called Solvay, who are the largest producers of hydrogen peroxide in the world. Um, and they have, as you can imagine, heaps of chemists <laughs> that know a lot about hydrogen peroxide um, and have always sort of disputed that information uh, that's been published as as being unreliable. So what we want to do is, is collect the data. No one has ever done that before, um, is collect this data and put it into those models and, and produce a reliable result. Um, and then eventually what we would we would hope to have is a, a, a much more um, well appreciated and recognized welfare friendly, environmentally friendly um, treatment for these fish. So I've talked a little bit about Pulsia. Um, the other uh, sort of string to their bow, as it were, that we want to do um, is look at the potential for treating more than one parasite at once. Um, I'm not sure if anybody here will have heard of it, but there's another parasite that affects salmonids called uh, amoebic gill disease. Um, and that is a, another extremely costly parasitic burden that these fish um, have to endure throughout their life cycle. And it's something that happens as the water becomes warmer, they become infected with these amoebae. Um, it, in, it really impacts their, their sort of overall, um, uh, how they thrive, they become very sick and they uh, essentially can't breathe. You know, these, these amoebae will infect their gills um, and really prevent them from, um, from, from being happy, healthy fish. Uh, so there, is a method for treating this disease also using hydrogen peroxide but unfortunately the dose that can be used is very much lower uh, than the dose that would be used for sea lice therefore this exacerbates the problem that we have with um with sea lice resistance wherever treatments with hydrogen peroxide are used for treating amoebic gill disease we see very very huge issues with um with sea lice resistance and we can't actually then go on to use this as, a, as an option in those areas um, so, so Pulsia's principal aim is is sort of developing this technology and enhancing this technology at the moment. We have a, a one working prototype um, being used currently for treating salmon farms, so it is out being being actively used at the moment. Um, this is the interesting part. This is kind of how it works. So um, in terms of the Pulsia innovation, so this is a picture of some sea lice that have been treated in a bioassay with uh, hydrogen peroxide on its own. Uh, the sort of authorised dose for treating sea lice is 1500 ppm. And uh, basically what happens is you get bubbles uh, uh, developing on the outside surface of these sea lice. Um, as those bubbles grow and get bigger and there are more of them, eventually the, the sea lice become buoyant and are detached from the sea lice, it kind of pulls them away. Um, the longer they are in contact with the hydrogen peroxide, the more kind of stunned they become um, and they do tend to just let go as well. And then they're uh, sort of taken more quickly to the surface with the bubbles present. And um, it doesn't really cause any specific damage to the sea lice. So they, this, this particular bioassay we actually ran for um, 40 minutes, which would be double the exposure time recommended uh, to see if that would have a, a greater impact. And when we looked at them under the microscope, they're still very much alive. Um, they haven't been killed by this treatment, which um, they they... 
The marketing authorization doesn't guarantee killing these, but we would hope that there would be at least some signs of, uh, you know, reduction in movement, for example. Um, but unfortunately, that didn't happen um, with these bioassays. And then when we introduce the uh, sound device, which interacts with these bubbles, um, basically you can see the, the main difference here is that there are lots and lots of bubbles on the inside of the sea louse. So when we turn on the sound, um, which has been specifically designed and patented uh, to generate frequencies that interact with bubbles of certain sizes that would be attracted to or can be targeted to these sea lice, um, they will oscillate, which means uh, we can make them move in directions that they wouldn't usually move. So a bubble should usually float off to the surface. Um, we can make them move downwards, sideways, get bigger, smaller. These are just the activities that occur when a bubble is oscillating. Um, we can't specifically cause any of those uh, in particular, but these these all happen while that bubble is oscillating. And that causes, uh, if, if there are bubbles that are attached to the sea lice and oscillating, this will actually pump more um, hydrogen peroxide in through the chitin layer of the sea lice through the porous areas um, and there will also be bubbles being generated in their gut so as they sort of ingest the hydrogen peroxide it will be broken down with the catalase present in their um, GI tract and uh, those bubbles inside will also begin to oscillate so as they um, generate more and more and more bubbles and they're oscillating and they're uh, sometimes you can see um, don't know if you can see my mouse, but there's a huge bubble um, just in this section here. Um, when they get really large bubbles, they can often rupture um, inside and that basically causes the, um, the sea lice to die, uh, which is not a very nice outcome for the sea lice, but it is unfortunately the outcome that we require um, when it comes to controlling these parasites. Um, and the other good thing is that this specific dose of, of um, hydrogen peroxide that we're using is also very well known to kill the, the egg strings. So it does sort of very much disrupt their, their life cycle overall. So uh, a, a common question is, um, you know, if we're if we're that awful to the sea lice, what guarantees we're not that awful to the um, fish themselves? Um, and that's a, an excellent question. Um, the basically before I started working with Aquapharma, I spent three years working directly with Pulsia. Um, as uh, Claudia mentioned, I am a vet and uh, I came into the industry specifically via a knowledge for the use of um, sound or ultrasound uh, in a clinical application or environment. Um, so I started this project knowing lots about sound and, and how it works with animals and how we can use it with animals. Um, and, and started basically looking at uh, how we can prove this technology is going to be safe for use with fish. Um, this was in partnership with the University of Stirling um, uh, and they, they have the Institute of Agriculture and an excellent reputation when it comes for working with um, sea lice uh, amongst many, many other things. Um, but we had a, a couple of professors on board with this project as well. And over the three years, we produced very extensive safety studies um, looking at how the fish interacted or how the sound interacted with the fish uh, on its own at different frequencies at different sound levels um, with and without hydrogen peroxide present and looking at how the bubbles interacted with the fish versus the, the sea lice and, and everything like that. The good thing about where this project started is that there was some data available already in terms of how um, sound impacts salmon in the environment. Um, and so, uh, salmon do have a, a hearing range and basically the sound that we chose is, is far out with their hearing range. So salmon actually have no perception. We can hear it, but the salmon have no perception of this sound at all. Um, our studies proved that um, they 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 aren't aware of the sound when it's when it's on. Um, they don't change. There's no changes found in their behaviour, and there's no um, pathological histopathological impacts that we've been able to find so far um, when we've run these studies. Um, and and the same results uh, for when we've used with and without hydrogen peroxide present at various doses, um, very high and and very low. And then the, the other studies that we completed were obviously looking at efficacy. So how well does this remove and kill sea lice when it's used with fish? Um, and we've had excellent results, um, really particularly with adult female sea lice, which are the most important ones to target because they're the most tightly regulated and they cause the most damage. And they're obviously the ones that breed. 
Um, so we we can improve efficacies from um, they can be as low as 30 percent uh, when hydrogen peroxide is used on its own and we can get them as high as uh, as 100 percent um, when we use the, the sound um, between 90 and 100 percent most most commonly, but up to 100 percent when the sound is used in combination. And the last thing we did during this uh, three year stint was prove that we can scale it. Um, there's no point doing this if we can't use it actively in fish farms. Um, so what we've been able to do is um, finalise the build and, and produce a, a working prototype uh, that is able to treat um, cages up to 160 metres, which is the biggest ones or among, almost the biggest ones you would find in Norway. Um, they are now producing 200 metre cages, which we would need an upgrade for. But uh, 160 metre cages are, are still pretty impressive and we're very pleased that it's um, it's given us such good results. One of the other things that I mentioned was the potential ability to use less. Um, so if if we can use the sound device to make it the outcome of hydrogen peroxide so much better, the obvious thing to look at is, well, can we use less of the hydrogen peroxide? And the answer is it should be yes. Um, we have run a number of bioassays also in that period while I was working with Pulsia um, to try and look at what happens when we reduce the dose of hydrogen peroxide and use the sound as well. And we went down as low as 500 uh, ppm, which is a third of the full dose. Uh, and basically what you can see in these pictures here is that these poor sea lice have, have really um, been very, very heavily affected by the, the, the combination of, of factors and their insides have unfortunately um, exploded. And uh, they've also been bleached by the, the hydrogen peroxide, which was uh, that got more pronounced as we went down the doses, uh, which was a, a very interesting finding. And we've got a lot more work to do there. But what it tells us is that this is possible. Um, and once we've got a um, an active treatment up and running using both the current dose of hydrogen peroxide and the, the, the technology itself, then our next phase is to, is to really um, accelerate how we are uh, looking into the, the lower doses themselves. So, um, like I mentioned, we've been doing a, a lot of work into how we can um, improve the, the outlook for um, or how people view uh, hydrogen peroxide in the environment. And because it is it is such a valuable tool in the in the box in terms of treating these fish whilst maintaining fish welfare. Um, we ran a series of field trials last year uh, where we basically followed a number of hydrogen peroxide treatments um, after tarpaulin release and had um, thousands of measurement points uh, for, for measuring concentrations of, of hydrogen peroxide in the environment, um, which have now been modelled. Um, we were working very closely with Sintef Ocean on this project, who are a, a Norwegian um, research entity. Um, some people may have heard of them. Um, but they are very well uh, recognised by the government, which is extremely helpful because they will know exactly what to look for and how to really produce uh, the best possible data when it comes to this study. Um, it's we we have uh, worked together with them to sort of provide the the equipment and the access, um, but it's kind of been we really wanted them to work sort of independently uh, on this so that we're not, you know, yes, we're Aquafarma and we provide hydrogen peroxide, but we would also um, like to help the world better understand what happens to, to hydrogen peroxide in these areas from an unbiased perspective. So we're very lucky to be able to be working with Sintef and we hope to have a publication um, on that outcome this year uh, fairly shortly. So watch this space for that. And then just um, finishing up, really, the biggest question is, is how are we going to impact the overall salmon farming industry? Um, we are focused on the salmon farming industry at the moment. Um, but really, like I said, our, our main focuses are improving um, fish welfare. There are fewer and fewer um, tarpaulin treatment options out there, especially when it comes to consideration from the for the environment. So there are many restrictions on other medicines that are used um, in tarpaulins, so directly in the cages. Uh, they don't have as good a profile for breakdown and environmental friendliness as, as hydrogen peroxide does. Um, it's very well tolerated by fish um, when it's used at the, the dose it should be used, which is 1500 ppm. We do see issues as those doses start creeping up because of resistance. So um, if we can really help that issue with resistance, we bring hydrogen peroxide back into the picture as a, a, a very available um, and, and sensible choice for, for treating these fish. 
obviously, if we can reach the, the combined treatment sweet spot, if we can treat amoebic gill disease uh, and sea lice together, um, then that's reducing the overall handling of these fish. We're doing two treatments or, you know, a number of treatments, reducing the need for a number of treatments and only doing one. Um, and obviously, from an environmental perspective, um, the, the number of regulations around how, how uh, products are released, etc., is, is always increasing. Um, and so if that always has a, a bearing on how farmers decide to, to treat their fish, be that with well boats or with, um, with tarpaulins and well boats, although they are uh, often more effective when it comes to sea lice treatments because the availability of medicines is greater um, and also mechanical treatments becoming available. Um, they are not great for the fish. They are, you know, it, it, it is the lowest uh, when it comes to fish welfare in terms of um, what they have to actually go through. through. So we really hope we're going to bring, uh, you know, an, an already existing option back on the table for, for the industry. And then the, the last sort of point there to cover is increasing transparency. So social license is becoming a, a really hot topic when it comes to fish farming and aquaculture in general. Um, we, as part of this project, have a huge um, responsibility to disseminate as much as we can, hence why I'm here speaking today. I spend most of my life speaking about this project these days, trying to help everyone understand that this is going on and this is what we're doing. Um, but we want to make sure that consumers, uh, as well as producers and every endpoint that there that exists for, for salmon farming is that we become more transparent and, and as transparent as we possibly can be. Um, the whole industry is moving in the right direction. Um, we're very keen to share knowledge uh, when it comes to these sorts of topics. Uh, so anything we can do to, to increase that and, and sort of overall increase consumer trust, um, as, as um, we've already alluded to during this webinar, you know, we aquaculture in general is one of the biggest sources for for protein to feed the world going forward so nobody's going to eat it if they don't trust it so um that's that's one of our our biggest goals going forward is to to help everyone understand what we're doing and that's really me um a bit of a whistle stop tour into breeze hopefully i've not been too short or too long um but my email address is there if you've got any questions please beyond this webinar, please drop me an email. Um, there's also a QR code there, which can take you to an info page. There are videos, leaflets, everything, um, hopefully on there that you might need uh, to find out more about the project and, and understand the progress as well. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. That was really a promising piece of, of, of research, a little bit more than, than just the, the research. And, uh, you know, you, you really kept us with the, high hopes in terms of, you know, consumer trust and, and transparency and, and the promising treatments you are bringing to, to, to the salmon fish farmers, which is probably not one of the uh, main activities here in, in, in Portugal. Um, so my question, you know, you, you really uh, share with us our developments of applying hydrogen peroxide uh, to, to cages as an innovative method to treat diseases on that particular effects on uh, salmon. And while you were presenting, I actually was wondering whether this method or this technology is applicable and effective to other ectoparasites in other fish species. And I tell you that in Portugal, we especially cultivate um, gilt-headed zebras and zebras. I know that you mentioned other diseases, but have you ever thought about uh, other fish species? Yes, so that, that's a, a really good question. So <clears throat> at the moment, um, the, the licensed medicine, uh, there are not many licensed versions of hydrogen peroxide for, for using in fish and Paramove is one of only two or three. Um, and it is only licensed for salmon at the moment. Um, the other species have used it. Um, it's 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 actually very effective for, um, for example, for trout who are also affected by sea lice, but it has to be used off license. Um, so basically, if you are treating a, a parasite um, in a different species, there is a, a special mechanism that exists to allow you to use 
uh, a medicine that's licensed in another species for a similar application. Um, there's some paperwork basically that you have to sign uh, to say that you've considered that and there's no other alternative. So um, it is, mm -hmm. I, I'm kind of not allowed to to talk about it because it's, it would be seen as recommending it for other species. But um, yes, there are other applications in other species. Um, there is not as much data available at the moment in terms of how safe it is or how, how it, it would impact those fish. Um, the difficulty uh, that we have in sort of warmer waters is that hydrogen per peroxide becomes less safe in warmer waters. So um, it becomes harmful at, at that point to the fish. So they, they can't tolerate nearly as high a dose. So um, it, the, the sort of swing and roundabout there is the warmer the water, the more active the hydrogen peroxide. So you would be able to use much less. Um, so there is probably a balance point there. Um, but unfortunately, the work hasn't been done um, at this point. It would be lovely if it was. <laughs> it's uh, We're actually quite a small team. It's something we'd love to do at some point, but we, we haven't got the resource at the moment. But it is definitely on our radar for... Um, for future research projects. Um, the, the next thing we're looking at currently is actually shrimp. So we are using it in shrimp currently for um, management of various viral and bacterial diseases in, in shrimp ponds, um, which we are, uh, is, a, is a work in progress at the moment. So very okay, much. Okay, Rachel, thank you so expand. much. Don't, don't worry, that's what we are here for, is to set up collaborative networks to ensure that we develop, you know, these projects towards the direction that, you know, benefits, you know, uh, a, a bigger amount of, of, of users or, you know, potential uh, um, clients. And, and you were talking about the, um, uh, the, the consequences of, uh, you know, warmer waters of uh, hydrogen peroxide, but we have here an interesting question that says that hydrogen peroxide generates oxi oxi oxidative stress to microorganisms like bacteria and, and yeast. Did you study the impact of the applied dose in microorganisms in the water? Have so you that, considered that this? That's an, another really good question. So that has been studied extensively as part of the application for the marketing authorization for this product in the very beginning. So when it became a veterinary medicine, um, it has to go through a, a specific amount of processes um, for them, for the regulatory authorities to decide how it is um, released in the environment or whether it has to be used by a well boat, for example. And because the profile of hydrogen peroxide and the speed of breakdown is so high, at the moment, um, the the picture or the, the consensus is, is that it is fast enough that it doesn't cause a long term impact in the areas that it is released because it hang, it doesn't hang around for a long. It has less of an impact than petrol, for example, as it, as a boat goes past. Um, so it is it is seen very favorably. Um, there there are studies and, and information available on on that uh, specific topic. It's not my main topic. Mine is mostly mm -hmm. around the fish. Um, but like I say, the, the process that the marketing authorization has been through and all of the environmental agencies in the various countries, um, they take all of this information into account. And it is one of the reasons why there are no restrictions on um, it, depending on the region, uh, on tarpaulin release, uh, the, the area we do see issues um, is Canada. So they have a much tighter restriction. Um, but interestingly, that has also been based on some of the data that has been um, less reliable. Uh, and we, we've had some conversations with the authorities around the data that we now have and the publication that's coming um, that may actually turn, turn that into a, a situation where tarpaulins come back into use even in Canada. Okay, thank you. Potentially. <laughs> thank you, Rachel, for being so so honest and, and open about uh, about the all, all these these issues. We have more questions, but I think we, uh, we need to give the floor to to João. Otherwise, we won't of course, get sorry. to yes. <laughs> to no 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 don't, don't worry. I'll, I'll I'll keep these questions to if we have more time uh, at the end. But we would like to to hear João and uh, all this knowledge about Mara. Uh, forest, which are also it's a very interesting top topic. So, Joel, thank you so much. Now the floor is is yours. Hello, thank you. Uh, I want to start to to thank you for for the invitation and congr congratulate also the initiative to to promote the scientific knowledge to to, to the society. And uh, I guess you are. We're not seeing the presentation mode, John. So if you can just click okay. on the bottom of your PowerPoint presentation. Mm -hmm. On the bottom, where it is. Yes. 
towards your right. Mm -hmm. Okay. The little screen there. Yeah. Perfect. And now I have to change. To change. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. okay so. <laughs> um, as uh, I was saying, to, to thank you and congratulate um, this initiative, I will move forward and fast. So, my talk will be about marine forests and uh, potential ecosystem service they provide. Uh, I'm pretty sure that most of you are aware of land forests, um, at least um, I know Amazonia, Congo and Borneo, they are quite famous for for all the, um, the biodiversity they, they support and the importance uh, for all of us. Uh, uh, in water, uh, in our oceans, maybe is not uh, so familiar for most uh, of you or not so well known, there are the marine forests uh, that I will talk uh, a bit uh, today, and particularly the, the case of kelp forests. So basically these kelp forests are, are marine habitats that represent the, the relatively sh shallow waters of, uh, of our uh, coast, particularly the um, the coasts of temperate and cold waters um, and they represent all the, the the substrates the rocky shore that is is dominated by large macroalgae in this case brown uh, macroalgae um, here you can see some pictures of what we you can see the canopy on the the top left and the, the other canopy the the view of uh, kelp forest this here in in iberia peninsula and um, for for the ones that uh, doesn't go doesn't dive maybe you can see this uh, at the beach sometimes uh, in certain certain time of the year we can see this uh, beach wreck that ends up on the beach so this is biomass that comes from uh, from uh, the nearby kelp forests so these kelp forests as I was saying, they 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 are present in I would say a quarter of the marine coastal habitats in, in when you talk about the the temperate and cold waters. So they they are worldwide representative of these uh, marine coastal habitats, and they if you do an, an uh, analogy with the, the land forests, they can support a lots of of goods and services. So they indeed they they support high levels of biodiversity so for example in a square meter of uh, a piece of uh, marine forest or kelp forest in this case you can find more than 1000 different species and in the same 1000 um, individuals so these these habitats they they really support high levels of biodiversity um, they also provide food, um, shelter, and habitat for a different, uh, for many, many species, in, including species that uh, we recognize with a high value, uh, high commercial value, so like lobsters or sea bass and, and, and so on. And um, definitely, they play a key role in creating and defining these uh, these communities. And uh, as I mentioned before. Uh, they are very, very productive in terms of um, carbon sequestration and creating in the creation of, of um, biomass. Um, actually, in terms of net productivity, they can can be compared as the tropical rainforests um, in terms of net productivity. And um, in fact, until very recently, the, the ability of these kelp forests to sequester carbon dioxide um, and therefore uh, helping in regulate the climate uh, has been kind of underestimated in these uh, assessments um, of goods uh, and services that they can provide to, 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 uh, to the society. But uh, more recently, some studies have been working and more um, are coming for, uh, in, the, in the short time. Um, some studies have uh, have shown that in many in many regions these forests can can produce uh, around twice or 11 times more biomass per area 
when compared to to the many crops uh, that we are uh, aware on land in terms of rice or wheat or corn and and so on and and then uh, we can see also examples uh, of the kelps the because they also provide us uh, with more tangible goods and services with socio-economic importance. They create biomass for alginates, uh, you know, fertilizer, food, bioactivate uh, compounds, and so on. They also um, a source for tourism and they have a cultural value. So overall, um, this Kelp forest, the seaweed habitats, um, they provide a wide range of ecosystem service and uh, and many bef benefits for all of us. So, including the supporting for coastal fisheries and maintaining uh, these high levels of biodiversity. Um, here you can see an example. Uh, not example. This is a study. These actually these values are a bit uh, underestimated. But uh, as I told you, more um, more uh, recent studies are are about to coming out and for instance here in Europe you can see uh, these calculations uh, on this paper they show that uh, hectare per year of kelp forests can 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 be translated into 221,000 um, of dollars per year and if you look to the the whole region just here in in Europe you can see uh, estimation about 512 millions um, for the whole region. So this kind of is important to translate this in numbers, to to translate this information to people. You know, so the the importance about the importance of these kelp forests and uh, not only in direct benefits but also uh, indirect benefits. But um, Given this, like um, like other ecosystems, um, kelp forests are also facing very difficult uh, conditions. You know, uh, indeed, large um, uh, la large portions uh, of the ocean forests have been recently disappearing for different reasons, and uh, this results in loss of habitat and also the carbon sequestration uh, potential. So drivers can be from storms, of course, the climate change in terms of warming because this is a cold temperate water species so as we face the the increase of sea water temperature we can also uh, face challenging challenges for this uh, for this uh, species or for these forests and in that sense it's important to to find out solutions somehow that could uh, that can um, can facilitate or help these uh, valuable ecosystems and actually we are um, according to the united nations we are in the ecosystem restoration um, decade so um, and also comparing to this study this is a, a plot from uh, from a study that duart uh, and his team uh, presented in science and uh, this is a different so pretty much the major ecosystems that you can can see across the world and when we look about projects in terms of restoration uh, of habitats and so on we can see the down here in the grade the kelp forest ecosystems are very very under um, these actions of of uh, of um, conservation when compared to to the mangroves or seagrass and so on so there is a general uh, an interest in trying in, in terms of recovering this uh, as you can see in these pictures or situations that we have on the left side provide uh, devoid of vegetation and it's important to to these ecosystems at some point to try to, to return to, to what they used to they used to be and here uh, with funding that we get and together with the uh, work with some companies we we um, we are uh, testing and um, creating scalable solutions in order to reforest our seas this is a snapshot what um, of what you are doing so basically we get seed supply and then we in in the laboratory in these hatcheries 
it somehow can be with uh, can be some analogies for sure uh, with with fish farming or uh, seaweed aquaculture with other purposes but then in 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 the hatchery in the lab we we boost this this process and then when we have um, little little algal, li little plants little kelp we deploy it from the boat and uh, and we monitor from from there so basically so going shortly from all these stages we collect these these parts of of um, the reproductive material and we we induce spor uh, sporulation and then we kept the spores let's say these seeds you now in ideal conditions and that will then be seeded uh, so our substrate is stones we call gravel and this gravel is uh, is seeded with uh, the spores uh, or different stages, and we keep these these uh, these cultures in optimal temperature um, temperature, light, nutrients, and and so on, because it is at these stages the they are more fragile, so we can um, provide the boost, so can they can be, you know, uh, grow faster and stronger, and uh, when they get uh, a, diff a smaller size or a size that they will be more uh, prone to to support the natural environment uh, like this we are talking about two three centimeters we we previously we check some some areas of course this uh, we there is always a background um, uh, work in terms of monitoring the places that and you try to understand why why these uh, these forces uh, have gone and um, we act we tend to act in in these zones um, and the idea here is to to do this deployment in a way that easy is and so one can do it so there is no need of uh, specialized uh, working or divers to to do the, this deployment so basically everyone can can do it simply from the boat and um, and after this deployment so far we have been done uh, doing this deployment here in portugal uh, and uh, there are some uh, we we were within a group that uh, does trying to do this, do these actions in different parts across uh, across the globe um, and basically after that we we monitor and here are some some cases of uh, that uh, success uh, so the idea he, here is that the um, it's the roots in in macroalgae we so the rhizomes it's not real roots because algae don't they don't have uh, roots the idea is that um, this looks like roots overcome the the gravel or the stone they they were seated on and attached to the natural floor and uh, from there they can they can follow their um, the natural cycle so this is um, some images of of plants that uh, of algae that were deployed um, last year and so we are happy to see some success and hopefully we will be uh, we are on the way to to do this uh, in, at large scale and um, <clears throat> to finish um, we are also doing some some tests and trials in 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 another materials for different applications in terms of in this case you have testing in some biodegradable uh, materials and that you have been have success as well so this opens um, <clears throat> Also perspectives to to application to different uh, different areas or, or different uh, different regions that might need uh, different materials and where where stones cannot be uh, applied. And um, um, well, this is much it. So you, if you want to know something more about these these issues, I'm happy to talk with you. And you, uh, that's it. It was a great presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, unfortunately, we are almost uh, uh, getting to our time. So I have here two questions. Thank you, Jumon, for reminding us of the, um, the seaweeds. It took me back to my, my younger ages. Uh, 
Uh, they were very common in our council. We had this kind of love and hate relationship with them. You know, they were always around, but uh, we were a bit scared <laughs> about them. So uh, it's great. I had a couple of questions. But I think I, I will give priority to to the questions from our participants. And one of the questions, can these water forests be planted anywhere? So can this marine forest be planted anywhere or are they specific to to, to a given um, climate and, and region? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yes, in theory, yes. Uh, I mean, of course, um, you this uh, as long as these habitats um, are. Um, I mean, the, the kelp forests are uh, associated to cold and temperate uh, waters, so there is no sense to put forests in the tropical area. Okay. Of course, but uh, of course, uh, and as long as we have substrate, because they they need to be attached to to natural rock. So sandy habitats or warm, warm waters are not suitable for the, for these uh, forests, and of course um, you you need to know in advance if the ecosystem is is somehow um, suffering from some kind of kelp forest decline in prior hand. It just yeah. Yes, and you 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 mentioned in your presentation you you showed a very good map where this uh, forest naturally uh, develop. One curiosity, João, how do you choose the site to replant the the kelps forest? What well, criteria do you use? Yeah, it's it's basically of uh, in uh, in ground knowledge basically because our team we have been uh, you know uh, studying these uh, kelp forests at least here in Iberia and uh, we are aware that some regions are uh, suffering from kelp decline for for different reason uh, different reasons and that's the way um, we choose our spots and and that's also means that if when we go for for these actions uh, that we know we should have previous knowledge how the ecosystems uh, are at the moment but so okay. i choose uh, based on my previous knowledge okay <laughs> so it's a bit subjective <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> okay but I, I imagine that all these uh, kelp ecosystems are in need of help so any reforestation should be of any assistance one final question to you Joao. So what is the biggest challenge in these uh, reforestation actions? We saw some lovely pictures. We all want to, to help. Hopefully, hopefully one day you, you launch an open day for all of us to go diving in the, in the ocean to help you with, with, the, with your, your, your projects. But you know, now more seriously, what are the biggest uh, uh, challenges towards the reforestation? Uh I, there are. I mean, I would say the biggest uh, challenges are always the the little things. You know, I guess for fish aquaculture is uh, might be something similar. So little details on uh, the. So what's the best time to to do the deployment? Um, which time of the year, or even in the lab? So little details on the the size that the 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 kelp should go go out from. Uh, uh, from the from the hatchery to to the natural environment, um, those those details, um, little things like like that, uh, that uh, that can help you to 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 maximize the the, the success of the reforestation actions. Yeah, exactly. The same the same principles apply that as they apply in land. It's uh, experience and 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 knowledge will yeah. definitely come. Uh, as uh, assistant. Um, so I will now have a final question. Fortunately, we don't have time for for more questions. So I would ask all the speakers from your from your expertise and the, from the work that you have been uh, doing. What do you think is missing in the current landscape of aquaculture? So if you could change one thing, what would be your priority? And eventually whether in this question of you know uh, consumer concerns and the role of certification to ensure animal welfare to ensure ecosystem service to ensure that that the the process is is fully transparent but from your perspective what do you think uh, um, aquaculture is needing the most at the moment in order to be a truly prosperous uh, system who would like to start. Rachel? 
Um, can I be I'll first? That. Yes, sure. I think alcohol has uh, evolved uh, from the last uh, 20 years because 20 years ago there were no certifications. Uh, Farmers could just release the drugs into the environment. We actually use hydroxid um, peroxy, uh, hydroxy peroxide, I never know, H2O2 uh, in the brims. Uh, and we didn't need any uh, advice from a vet. So now uh, that has it cha uh, changed a lot. Um, I don't think there is such a high environmental uh, concern yet um, regarding um, consumers. I think they are worried about uh, the quality of the farmed fish. I think that is something that has to be, has to be worked out because aquaculture fish is uh, very, very good and consuming fish is very good for uh, humans. And I think there is um, a need to kind of show to the consumers how good fish are, because most people think that the fish has drugs, has uh, chemicals incorporated. And the fact is that, uh, at least in Portugal, of course, outside Europe, there are less um, regulations and they can do uh, many of the things that we used to do 20 years ago, but that uh, will evolve as well. Uh, I think my concern nowadays is actually uh, fish welfare. It's something that uh, there is still a long way to go, uh, because even if you have the advice from a vet, I think there isn't still uh, um, the need to look for other options, other bio options, I would say. Uh, I think some countries have already started doing that, so Canada and Norway, but I think here in Europe I don't besides Norway, I don't think there is that uh, high concern for for fish welfare or at least at the industrial level, which is the one that has more impact on the environment. Okay, and that's probably something that needs to be so passed on to the consumers also because more pressure should also come and eventually certification could be something also that could assist on that. And Margarida, I really enjoy your suggestion. Maybe we should have fish tastings at the supermarket. We could all do blind tastings of fish from aquaculture. Uh, uh, the spot the I've, I've actually done before these. Uh, we have here in IPMA um, a sensory panel. And once I've tried meager from a farm uh, and from the wild, and actually the farm one was much better. So I think there is if people do this kind of blind taste, I think they would be surprised because there is high content in the farmed fish, but it ha there is also a higher succulents. So the fish is not dry when you're cooking it. Um, and so, of course, there are some things like taste that uh, need to be worked out. But I think mainly the, the biggest concern of farm fish is still texture. It's much softer than the, the wild fish. But in terms of taste, I think people would actually be surprised. Yes, thank you, Margarita. Rachel, what I can about probably, you? Probably just really echo um, what Margarita said there. Um, that the biggest, the the biggest concern, certainly within the industries I work in, are, are animal welfare. Um, and uh, I would say that certainly within salmon farming, there is a a lot. Um, I apologise, my toddler is about to arrive. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is a there is a lot uh, of research and innovation going into one second. Okay, so that's definitely animal welfare because it also has an implication in terms of economics. Uh, so we need to to make sure that. <laughs> what a timing, Rachel. <laughs> it's always like this. <laughs> it's always the way. Sorry about that. But yes, um, there is a lot of research and, and innovation going on. Um, some of the problems are that, that I um, encounter are, are around funding and access to funding um, and an ease of, of, you know, navigating through those funding processes. Um, you know, we're not we're not all huge corporate companies that have buckets and buckets of money to put behind research and development. 
Um, so I think there there could be more avenues for for these development projects and ideas to to really come to life. Um, and I think there's a lot of legislation in the way. Um, we have problems in the UK with uh, with these regulations which are being addressed. Um, things are easier in some countries. Things are harder in other countries. But generally, you know, cross industry and inter industry dissemination of knowledge and sharing of knowledge as well. I think will be you know using ideas from one industry to the next on on how to improve these these issues will also be a, a big boost in the future I think so yeah definitely animal welfare is a focus environment close second probably <laughs> yes you can't have one you, without the other yes Rachel and you also pointed to to something that Margarita also mentioned that the development of uh, fish farms in in Africa and, and Asia and this might uh, lead to other concerns because these these industries are less regulated, and and probably the detrimental side effects uh, need to be also taken in, into account. And we should cross uh, lessons and and learnings so that we all have our marine forest protected, right? Well, <laughs> indeed, indeed. Maybe diversification um, would also be a good idea. No, um, more algae, less fish. Why not? We know, we all know that algae are good for <laughs> as food. So, so but I guess uh, regarding fish, fish aquaculture, I guess uh, it's going to to be easy because at the end uh, people tend to forget uh, the flavor of the the wild fish. At some point, people only will know <laughs> the flavor of farmed fish. It's it's like uh, it's like hunting. We we don't eat what we hunt. I don't know since the 15th century. So I I, I bet if most of the people we would would eat a wild rabbit at the moment, we, they will not enjoy it. The taste. <laughs> so yes, I guess farming we, is. We lost contact. Farming fish farming is in the in uh, in a good way and uh, like uh, Margarita and Rachel said it's. Uh, Welfare and regulation. We we are on the good way. Let's let's hope. With the with the twist of algae, in our seafood will be fine. Okay, we need to introduce algae also in our in our diets more. Again, let's propose uh, algae uh, tasting, blight tasting at the supermarkets to start convincing. <laughs> The, the consumers. It was a pleasure to have you all here. I, I now need to, to, to call to a close our, our session. I think we had a very interesting and good starting point for future discussions. Thank you so much to, to our lovely speakers for being here and to share your thoughts. Thank you so much also to our audience to be to be here and to, to contribute with wonderful questions. Just let me remind you that next week we will continue with the ecosystem services and this time we will be more focused on food production, trying to understand, you know, how ecosystem directly links with this uh, this specific service that that uh, you know the soils are, are giving us. So thank you so much again. I hope to see you all next week, next same time, same link. We will be here to welcome you. Thank you so much, and I hope you have enjoyed. Thank Bye. you. Bye.